Through the calendars, date stelae, monumental inscriptions, regnal lists, annals and timekeeping systems from the ancient world all the way to today, there is a hidden calendar embedded into the structure of reality. Unbroken, perfect, found in the writings of our predecessors, mentioned by writers thousands of years ago. Every 138 years, it brings changes to our world, edits, resets, and then disguises these changes under the guise of natural disasters. The Phoenix phenomenon causes mud floods, resets, mass vanishings, edits of history altering the trajectory of social and political events, introduces new materials, new translations to older texts, strange phenomena, a small window of time in the month of May, every 138 years, when the veil between our world and somewhere else is rent open and there is an exchange of materials. At Archaics.com and the Archaics YouTube channel, you will find in numerous examples and data sets showing you that this strange overseer protocol has totally forged the unfolding of historical events and will return in May of 2040. Our world is not what you think. An old manuscript surfaced in the mid-19th century mentioning a phoenix-like cataclysm and describing catastrophic ruin, earth changes, including volcanic eruptions, strange weather, and rapid sea level changes. This book refers to the earliest Europeans, a race, a race war against a black-headed people by a fair-featured people, the Frisians, matriarchal society, and has much criticism against priests. The book goes into a lot of detail on ordinances and laws and has been judged authentic by many scholars. However, other academics isolating particulars to dismiss the whole have largely condemned the text as they have so many others that have surfaced from antiquity. Let's look into this amazing text to see why the establishment will want to keep us from discovering what it contains. The following fragment in the Oralind text is very similar to Sumerian writings about the Anunnaki enslaving mankind to dig ores. In the olden times, the Slavonic race knew nothing of liberty. They were brought under the yoke like oxen. They were driven into the bowels of the earth to dig metals. In the Orland manuscript, we read how the bad time came. This is dated in the manuscript as 2193 B.C. or 46 years from the actual flood date of 2239 B.C. established by over 40 different ancient sources. During the whole summer, the sun had been hid behind the clouds, as if unwilling to look upon the earth. There was perpetual calm, and the damp mist hung like a wet sail over the houses and marshes. The air was heavy and oppressive, and in men's hearts was neither joy nor cheerfulness. In the midst of this stillness, the earth began to tremble as, she, as if she was dying. The mountains opened to vomit forth fire and flames. Some sank into the bottom of the earth, and in other places, mountains rose right out of the plain. All the land, called by the seafaring people, at land, disappeared, and the wild waves rose so high over hill and dale that he, everything was buried in the sea. Many people were swallowed by the earth itself, and others who had escaped the fire perished in the water. It was not only in, in Finda's land that the earth vomited fire, but also in Twiskland, which we believe is Germany. Whole forests were burned one after the other, and when the wind blew from that quarter, our land was covered with ashes. Rivers changed their courses, and at their mouths new islands were formed of sand and drift. During three years this continued, but at length it ceased, and forests became visible. Many countries were submerged, and in other places land rose above the sea, and the wood was destroyed throughout the half of Twistland. Troops of Finda's people came and settled in the empty places. Our dispersed people were exterminated or made slaves. This last latter part was the year 3004. 5 BC. Remember, this is a this is an estimate by the writer. 
Earth, the Mother Earth, shook her forest and her mountains. Rivers flowed over the land. The sea raged. Mountains spouted fire to the clouds. And what they vomited forth, the cloud flung upon the earth. At the beginning of the Arnamaim, the harvest month, the earth bowed towards the, the north, a pole shift, and sank down lower and lower. The lowlands of Freya's land were buried under the sea. The forests of Lindor Orden were almost all gone. Wherein Ludgard used to be, it became sea. The waves swept over the fortifications. The houses lay heaped eat, uh, over each other. The same thing had happened to other citadels as to ours. In the upper lands, they had been destroyed by the earth. In the lower lands, they had been destroyed by water. All the land to the north was sunk under the sea and has never been recovered. At the mouth of the Flamir, as we were told, 30 salt swamps were found, consisting of the forest and the ground that had been swept away. At West Flyland, there were 50. The seafaring people and other travelers who were at home had saved themselves, their goods, and their relations upon their ships. But the black-headed people at Lettysburg and Alkerman had done the same. And as they went south, they saved many girls. And as no one came to claim them, they took them for their wives. The people who came back all lived within the lines of the citadel. As outside, there was nothing but mud and marsh. The old houses were all smashed together. And this occurred 1,888 years after the submersion of Atland which to, in the Frisian manuscript is referred to as the Great Flood. The Frisian manuscript dates the Deluge disaster at 2193 BC, and this next disaster was 1,888 years later, or 305 BC, which is very close to the Phoenix year of 307, on the 138-year timeline of the Phoenix reset. Now, continuing the Frisian manuscript, we find that for 282 years, we had not had an earth mother. And now, when everything seemed lost, they set about choosing one. Ten years after that, the seafarers came from Forana and Lidisburg. They wished to drive the black-headed people with their wives and children out of the country. This would be 15 to 13 B.C. Cities of black-headed people in ancient northern Europe seem to have been the most, the more indigenous, like the Iberic stock, and the Frisians of fair features came later. So far, we have here a description of two major world cataclysms, and they fit the Phoenix, the Phoenix timeline almost perfectly in description. We can forgive them for being a couple years off. The Frisian prophecy of the last days is equally interesting. It reads, one bad time has passed by, but there is still another coming. Eartha has not given birth, and Waralda has not decreed it. It comes from the east, out of the bosom of the priests. It will breed so much mischief that Eartha will not be able to drink the blood of her slain children. It will spread darkness over the minds of men like storm clouds over the sunlight. Everywhere craft and deception shall contend with freedom and justice. Freedom and justice shall be overcome, and we with them. But this success will work out its own loss. Our descendants shall teach their people and their slaves the meaning of all three words. They are universal love, freedom, and justice. At first they shall shine, then struggle with darkness, until every man's head and heart has become bright and clear. Then shall oppression be driven from the earth, like the thunder clouds by the storm wind, and all deceit will cease to have any more power over the earth. So in the end, we have from the Frisians, ancient Frisians, a manuscript that describes two global cataclysms that mirror the Phoenix episodes, promises a third cataclysm in the last day that will be followed by, actually, a redemption of the earth, a message of hope. The following events are all dated in these sources as occurring from 525 to 536 AD and listed below in the order that they happened. An earthquake was felt throughout all of Europe damaging many cities. In the month of May an earthquake destroyed the jewel of the east, the city of Antioch in Syria, as flames were seen descending from the sky and a horrible stench bubbled up from the ocean, according to John of Ephesus. It is estimated that 250,000 people died in the city of, of Antioch alone. Byzantium 
Astronomers record the appearance of a comet-like object in the sky, followed by an earthquake. In Historia Ecclesiasticae by John of Ephesus, we read, There was a sign from the sun, the like of which had never been seen or reported before. The sun became dark, and its darkness then lasted for 18 months. A Syrian scribe described, a Syrian, excuse me, a Syrian scribe described the change as the sun began to be darkened by day and the moon by night, while the ocean was tumultuous with spray. Byzantine historian Procopius wrote, For the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during the whole year. Another writer of the time, Zacharias of Mytilene, in his Chronicle 919-1011, wrote, The sun began to darken by day and the moon by night, while the ocean was, was chaotic with spray from the 24th of March in this year to the 24th of June in the following year. By all accounts, this strange cloud blotted out the sun over southern Europe, the Mediterranean, North Africa, and Asia. It was a kind of dust veil. In China, it was reported that yellow dust rained from the sky like snow. In the Chronicle of John Malalas, it was a major flooding occurred in Asia Minor. Scientists aren't even in agreement today about what the, what the cause was. Some claim volcanic activity. Others speculate it was a major impact event that thrust dust particles into the air. Some point to dendrochronology as a source of data, but it's already been shown that a year with two good rain seasons will produce two rings in a single year, making tree ring counting totally unreliable. Further, ice core samples, tree rings, historical accounts, they they have all been compromised by the lying scientific community, which has been caught over and over in their deceits to favor the ruling party throughout history. If the establishment needs, needs a certain output to, say, 536 A.D., then all the engines of science will arrange their reports to reflect this date. The dendrochronological and ice core data confirms that at the period at this period, within 20 years, there was a total climate change all over the world. But these relative dating methods cannot provide an exact date. The 800-page scientific treatise Evolution Cruncher will educate you on how inaccurate these systems are and how scientists use them anyway. As we are following the list of events in their chronological order, we find the list to be an initial great earthquake in the month of May as flames fall from the sky, as submarine quakes release putrid air. A comet-like object is seen in the sky just before these events that were followed by earthquakes. The oceans are restless and a dust veil fills the atmosphere and blocks out the sunlight and remains aloft 18 months. Strange dust in the sky and yellow dust in China along with a lot of flooding. All of these items are traits of the Phoenix phenomenon. Scientists today are convinced that a supervolcano erupted in Central America and caused this dust veil. These events were followed immediately by a terrible drought recorded all over the world at this time. In China alone, Drought starvation so terrible that according to the Beishi Chronicles, 80% of the population died and cannibalism was rampant. It is my, my contention that all of these events actually occurred in the same year and that we have records that this year was precisely 522 A.D. And this would not be the first time that church agents altered historical records. In fact, Harvard University medieval historian Michael McCormick believes that it was an entire 10-year period of absolute chaos and disasters. Further demonstrating that the years were tampered with by the church record keepers, in the year 538, according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, copied over by church scribes, a strange eclipse of the sun occurred, and the stars were seen in daytime. But historians have discredited this because computer simulations show that no eclipses occurred at that time over England. So, 
We have here an ancient chronicle that describes an event that happened but could not have happened in the year alleged. 538. But the Chronicle describes yet a second eclipse, this time happening in 540. And again, computer analysis demonstrates that no eclipse has occurred. So if we believe in the integrity of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, which have been used by historians to date other events, then a sun darkening occurred, but somebody has tampered with the dates. The Roman Church and then the worldwide cryptocracy may have buried the truth in falsified dates that all fit within a 25-year period, but some did escape their book burnings. In 522 AD, a series of earthquakes afflicted Olympia, Greece. A comet was seen in 522 by Chinese astronomers, but it may not have been a comet. It was an astronomical body. At that time period, almost all things were called, called hairy stars or bearded stars, but it could have been anything. Records of Octa of Kent in Britain describe that dragons were seen in the sky, and the sky rained blood and began a famine. Note, this is plural, dragons. And many ancient cultures describe Phoenix and the Nemesis X object as sky dragons, just as the prophecies of Mother Shipton do. And also in the year 522 began a 40-year drought that ended the Mosh culture of Peru. Notice, this is a, a record claiming dragons were seen and associated to the raining of blood, which I have shown many times is a chief trait of the Phoenix phenomenon. Red mud falling from a blue sky, red rains and red dusts. These disasters listed above were all first in chronological in the chronological records, and they were caused by the phoenix in 522, as we will see. But the second dragon was an entirely different event. It was Nemesis X object appearing months later and bringing with it the plague. Remember, 522 was the only year in all of recorded history that phoenix and the Nemesis X object were in the system at the same time. The plague that followed all these events, though lasting for less than a year, killed people so quick that it is estimated that 13 to 26 percent of the world's population died. Almost 75 percent of villages in parts of Sweden were abandoned in these years, and historians note mass migrations everywhere. It is the start of the Dark Ages. John of Ephesus stated that people died at a rate of 5,000 to 16,000 a day, and that men at the city gates stopped counting the exiting corpses at 230,000 when they realized that the remaining dead bodies were innumerable. Procopius claimed that 10,000 people died a day, and that the plague lasted for four months in Constantinople alone. The historian John of Ephesus wrote, It was learned that men became enraged, like dogs, became mad, attacked one another, went into the mountains and committed suicide. These things were only considered as like signs of an evil omen, but the scourge progressed and reached the lands of Cush on the confines of Egypt, and from there it spread to Egypt itself. Like the two edges of the reaper, it successfully passed across the world, and progressed without stopping. When the greater part of the people had perished, to the extent that Egypt was deprived of its inhabitants, ruined and deserted, it fell upon Alexandria and consumed a multitude of people. Then there is a revealing statement from John of Ephesus. He says, the plague fell over ships in the midst of the sea, whose sailors were suddenly attacked by God's wrath and the ship became a tomb for their captains, and they continued to drift on the waves, carrying the corpses of their owners. This is evidence that the Great Black Death Plague, which came in 1346 and 1347, which was came from the sky, according to the historians of the time, not rats on ships from China, is the same thing that happened in the Justinian Plague. It came from the sky. 
This series of events, disasters, famine, and plague were caused by Phoenix and the Nemesis X object, but that's my conclusion. Now, I'm going to reveal what I have found, and I'm going to let you make up your own mind. The track record of the Roman papacy is full of forged documents, whole histories that were rewritten. Scholars have discovered in numerous false statements, pseudo-histories, and forged documents dating, dating even before the infamous donation of Constantine, where the papacy basically stole authority and wealth by claiming Constantine willed the church his empire at his death. Rome produced a document as proof to the European nobility, but later it was proven to be a forgery, for the careless church writer quotes from the Latin Vulgate scriptures in the donation, which did not exist at the time of Constantine. Tragic mistake there. Scholars have found whole books forged and have isolated hundreds of false statements in the writings of Eusebius and Augustine, as well as other church fathers. There is also the proven historical fact that agents of Rome have actively destroyed thousands of history and religious books and retained copies of some of them penned by their own scribes. A further provable significance is that for centuries the terror of the Inquisition had confiscated books not approved by the church, tortured and condemned to dungeons and death those caught with materials that opposed any of the positions held by the church. In the burning times, people and publications were burned to ashes. So, to suspect Rome had also falsified the dates of historical events is not a leap. In fact, it's to be expected. Remember, the Roman Church does not endorse the Book of Jasher, the Colburn Bible, the Dutch Orlind Manuscript, the Prophecies of Mother Shipton, or the Quatrains of Nostradamus, and all five of these have in common actual historical and prophetic material relating to the Phoenix Phenomenon. These involve sun darkening episodes when dust clouds in the heavens blocked out the sun and turned the moon red as blood as rocks rained from the sky during earthquakes as a red star appeared in the heavens. Taking all of this into consideration, I will now ask you to absolutely, objectively disregard all the facts that I have given you in this video so far. Put them to the side because we don't need this horrible track record to understand the astounding information I'm about to share, to you, share with you. Lynn Hunt, author of Measuring Time, Making History, and professor of history at UCLA, wrote that the origin of our Anno Domini calendar, quote, one of the early writers to date, this was Dionysius Exiguus, a monk who in 525 AD was intent on working out when exactly Easter would occur in the coming years. Given the importance of calculating when significant religious occasions should be observed, he formulated a new table of which the holiday would fall, starting from a year that he called 532. 532? It would seem strange since at the time, 532 wasn't even a year on any calendar extant in that day. What possible significance could this number be to an agent of Rome? My friends, the answer to this riddle comes from an old book published in the year 1900. If this thesis is true, then there must be some trace, some evidence that a tampering with the calendar had occurred. And I found what I was looking for in the research by a scholar, Alexander Del Mar, and it is astonishing. In his book, The Worship of Augustus Caesar, Alexander Del Mar of Cambridge Encyclopedia Publishing Company, it was published in 1900, in the book, it's dedicated to ancient cycles and calendars. Y'all know that's my thing. But we find some amazing gems. In it is mentioned that Aristarchus and Censorinus mention the 2484 year cycle, which is a phoenix period I've covered in many of my other presentations and in my published books. 
We learn that in the Hindu text, Surya Siddhanta, there is a recognition of an ancient 360 day year. And concerning the Anunnaki neurochronology I have published so much about, we read on page 278 of Alexander Del Mar's book, quote, there is no known cycle of 600 years, either astronomical or astrological, yet this measure of time was often used by ancient writers. For example, Herodotus, Josephus, Censorinus, and others, unquote. Concerning the ancient divine year, Del Mar wrote, the dominant measures of the divine year were the Brahmanical 658 common years and the Buddhic of 552 years. He relates that the 552 year cycle was recognized in Armenia and in Persia, but Rome was by the year 1080 AD imposing a new cycle called the Paschal, which abbreviated the 552 year well-known ancient cycle to the new 532 year cycle which is first mentioned in the year 1372 by Argyrus. See this chart? This chart was published in my 2009 book, When the Sun Darkens, and shows the 552-year Phoenix cycles, showing that they continue to 522 AD. In fact, here's several charts. Exeduous had already designed the Anno Domini calendar in 524, according to this book published in 1900. Today, the textbooks claim it was 525. This is very close to 522, date of the Phoenix and the Nemesis X object, the only year in all world history I have told you that both objects were at perihelion together in the same year. We have a calendar manipulation admitted by Del Mar, citing Dr. Greswell, who, quote, reluctantly admits that the canon imputed to Theophilus of Alexandria was set back purposely from AD 385 to AD 380. Why is this significant? Well, 384 AD was a Phoenix year, and we have a historical document as witness as related in my vi other videos. In fact, 384 was a Phoenix year 138 years before the 522 AD date we are explaining right now. What we have here is an admission by scholars in 1900 that the Roman authority deliberately dates an event four to five years off from, from when it was historically recognized. But this is only interesting. The real evidence I'm demonstrating is so much deeper. Del Mar wrote that the Roman authority now imposed the new divine year of 532 years called the Augusto Dionysian Standard, and the canon of Dionysius Exiguus was set back a paschal period of 532 years from A.D. 524 to B.C. 9. Alexander Del Mar writes that this change was imposed in the year 1056 A.D by the papacy, and then relates that Dr. Greswell knew even more of what happened, but refused to go into any more detail. But if the true start date of Exedua's new dating method was 9 BC, and his calculated start date for the new system was the 532nd year, then 532 years later is 522 AD the year that Phoenix and Nemesis X object were here together. We are confronted here with absolute proof that the Roman church invented a calendar to hide the 552 year Phoenix cycle that ended on 522 AD. We have here proof that Dionysius Exiguus, who invented the calendar, was dead five centuries before the church backdated his start date and attached to it a 532-year cycle of Rome. And this deception still wasn't accepted by the rest of the world for another 500 years. All this means is simple. Something major happened in the year 522, so epic, the Scythian monk Dionysius Exiguus created a whole new calendar that was accepted by the Roman authority. This authority then made changes to their own historical documents to bury the knowledge of this 552-year cycle that ended in 522. 
They imposed their new 532 year cycle that went back to BC 9 from 524 AD. This completely did away with the knowledge of the 552 year Phoenix cycle. And to add insult to injury, under the new Anno Domini calendar, the events of 522 were now entered into the historical record as having happened in 532 AD. 532 being their new Paschal cycle that replaced the 552 year Phoenix cycle. And they invented the lie that Exiguus created the Anno Domini calendar to calculate Easter. This was actually very easy to do, for as Hunt in her book relates, about the BC AD system, the hinge idea that there's a before Jesus and after Jesus really only took root in the 17th and 18th century. The church has had 12 centuries to perfect the deception. How many other Phoenix appearances have they destroyed? Further, we have from the testimony of Cassiodorus, a historian who was alive when Dionysius Exeguus was alive, write, writing that his, this inventor of the Anno Domini calendar wasn't just anyone. He lived in Rome and was assigned the duty of organizing, organizing the papal archives by none other than Pope Gelasius I. And then Pope John I had Dionysius write a chronology of the world for the church and officialize it with a new calendar, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Dionysius was a scholar. He wrote over 400 works, was a translator of Greek to Latin and a mathematician. In short, he was an agent of the Roman papacy and his Anno Domini calendar was specifically designed to hide something. Nothing ever honest comes out of the papal chambers. I have shown in my videos and charts that the common denominator between the start date of ancient calendrical systems was that they began just after great cataclysms. Anunnaki nerves of 600 years began 5239 BC at the Nemesis Cataclysm. The Annus Mundi Old World calendar began 3895 BC as year one of the pre-flood world after a phoenix pole shift created a virtual new heavens and new earth from its vast destruction. The Mayan Long Count of 3113 BC began the North American Impact Event. It has always bothered me that the Anno Domini calendar just appeared without a catalyst, meaning there was no real need for calendar reform because the Roman Julian system was working just fine, and it continued to be used for centuries. We are told Exeduus made up the AD calendar to calculate the next days when it would be Easter, which is a total lie. Remember, all calendars are created in retrospect, long after an event. So now, having discovered this, I'm satisfied that the Anno Domini calendar is not different from the others, specifically created from the occurrence of a cataclysm. As I have shown in my published books and videos, the Phoenix Cataclysm of 1687 BC known as the Ogygian Flood caused a 25-year darkness, worldwide reset of famine and disease. The civilizations of the world did not stir awake until 1662 BC. The Phoenix had brought trillions of tons of red mud and reddish dust that filled the atmosphere. What happened in history is for our later instruction. All the Justinian plague, sun darkening, wars, chaos, and starvation of Procopius and other authors fit into this same 25-year period from 20, 522 AD to 547 AD. We have a major Phoenix reset covered up by the Roman Church. This 1687 BC event was also on the 552-year Phoenix timeline. My conclusion is that the church scribes concerning 522 AD listed all of the events that happened in 522 and then spread them over a 25 year period which would have been easy to do. And now for the real gem. 522 AD was on the 552 year Phoenix chronology but this cycle did not end. 552 years later was 1074 AD and 552 years after that was 1626 AD when Phoenix was recorded and documented. It was in Asia. But then, but this was 552 years till the end of the cycle, to the year 2178. How many of you know why 2178 is significant in our holography?
The Colburn Bible is separated into several books. The first is called the Book of Creation. In the Book of Creation 1-2, we read, There are no true beginnings on earth, for here all is effect, the ultimate cause being elsewhere. This, then, is how these things were told in the great book of the sons of fire. Sounds like a controlled holosphere to me. God laid his hand upon man, saying, Now, you are even as I, except you sleep. They're enclosed in matter in the kingdom of illusion, while I dwell here in the freedom of reality and truth. It is not for me to come down to you, but for you to reach me. Again, I'm reminded of Maya, the world of illusion, the ancient Vedic texts. I refer again to the holosphere. In chapter 3 of the book of creation called Destruction and Recreation, we read in chapter 3, verse 1, It is known, and the story comes down from ancient times, that there was not one creation but two, a creation and a recreation. It is a fact known to the wise that the earth was utterly destroyed once, then reborn on a second wheel of creation. Now, concerning this wheel, Earth moved into our present solar system on this new ecliptic plane. That's a wheel. After the day star imploded into Nemesis, Genesis also describes two creations, and this is known by all biblical scholars. Notice that nowhere in the Colburn Bible are any books of the known Bible mentioned. This is evidence of being older. It is also evidence of being an independent writing. Now, in the book of Creation 3, 2, we read, At the time of the great destruction of earth, God caused a dragon from out of the heaven to come and encompass her about. The dragon was frightful to behold. It lashed its tail. It breathed hot fire and coals, and a great catastrophe was inflicted upon mankind. The body of the dragon was wreathed in a cold, bright light, and beneath, on the belly, was a ruddy-hued glow, while behind it trailed a flowing tail of smoke. It spewed out cinders and hot stones, and its breath was foul and stenchful, poisoning the nostrils of men. Its passage caused great thunderings and lightnings to rend the thick, darkened sky, all heaven and earth being made hot. The seas were loosened from their cradles and rose up, pouring across the land. There was an awful shrilling trumpeting from the sky, which, which outpoured even the howling of the unleashed winds. Now, <clears throat> my own note here is Phoenix identified in the oldest records as a sky dragon, the trumpeting sound accompanying every visit. In the book of Creation 3.3, 3, we read, Men, stricken with terror, went mad at the awful sight in the heavens. They were loosed from their senses and dashed about, crazed, not knowing what they did. The breath was sucked out from their bodies, and they were burnt with a strange ash. Then it happened, leaving earth and wrapped within a dark and glowering, glowering mantle, which was ruddily lit up inside. The bowels of the earth were torn open in great writhing upheavals, and a howling whirlwind rent the mountains apart. The wrath of the sky monster was loosed in the heavens. It lashed about in flaming fury, roaring like a thousand thunders. It poured down fiery destruction amid a welter of thick black blood. So awesome was the fearful, fearfully aspected thing that the memory mercifully departed from man. His thoughts were smothered under a cloud of forgetfulness. Book of Creation 3.5 The earth vomited forth great gusts of foul breath from awful mouths, opening up in the midst of the land. The evil breath bit at the throat before it drove men mad and killed them. Those who did not die in this manner were smothered under a cloud of red dust and ashes as, were as they were swallowed by the yawning mouths of earth or crushed beneath crashing rocks. Now, the cloud of red dust is a signature of Phoenix in all the old accounts, as many of you know who have been following my books and videos. The Book of Creation 3.6, the first sky monster was joined by another, which swallowed the tail of the one going before, but the two could not be seen at once. The sky monsters reigned and raged above the earth, doing battle to possess it, but the many-bladed sword of God cut them in pieces, and their falling bodies enlarged the land and sea. Note, Mother Shipton and Nostradamus both describe two back-to-back -back world destructions in the last days, one of the culprits being called a sky dragon and the return of the sky dragon. Now, Book of Creation 3.7 In this manner, the first earth was destroyed by calamity descending from out of the skies. The vaults of heaven had opened to bring forth monsters more fearsome than any that had ever haunted the dreams of men.
Book of Creation 3.8. Men and their dwelling places were gone. Only sky boulders and red earth, red mud, remained where once they were. But amidst all the desolation, a few survived, for man is not easily destroyed. They crept out of the caves and came down from the mountainsides. Then the great canopy of dust and cloud, which encompassed the earth, enshrouded it in heavy darkness, was where it was pierced by a ruddy light, and the canopy swept down in great cloud bursts and raging storm waters. Cool moon tears were shed for the distress of earth and the woes of men. Book of Creation 311. When the light of the sun pierced the earth's shroud, bathing the land in its revitalizing glory, the earth again knew day and night, for there were now times of light and times of darkness. The smothering canopy rolled away, and the vaults of heaven became visible to men. Book of Creation 312. The rainstorms ceased to beat upon the faces of the land, and the waters stilled their tor turmoil. Earthquakes no longer tore the earth open, nor was it burned and buried by hot rocks. The land masses were reestablished in stability and solidity, standing firm in the midst of the surrounding waters. The oceans fell back to their assigned places, and the land stood upon its foundations. Life was renewed, but it was different. Man survived, but he was not the same. Man stood in the midst of renewal and regeneration. He looked up into the heavens above in fear for the awful powers of destruction lurking there. Henceforth, the placid skies would hold a terrifying secret. When men came forth from their hiding places and refuges, the world their fathers had known was gone forever. The face of the land was changed. The earth was littered with rocks and stones which had fallen when the structure of heaven collapsed. One generation groped in the desolation and gloom, and as the thick darkness was dispelled, its children believed they were witnessing a new creation. Time passed, memory dimmed, and the record of events was no longer clear. Generation followed generation, and as the ages unfolded, new tongues and new tales replaced the old. I remind you that this text was written over 2,000 years ago. The Book of Creation 4.3 There were some who struggled harder. More were disciplined, because their forefathers had crossed the great dark void. Their desires were turned to Godward, and they were called the children of God. Book of Creation 4.4 4. Their country was undulating and forested. It was fertile, having many rivers and marshes. There were great mountains to the east and to the west, and to the north was a vast, stony plain. This describes ancient North America between the Rockies and Appala Appalachians. Book of Creation 4.5 then came the day when all things became still and apprehensive, for God caused a sign to appear in the heavens so that men should know the earth would be afflicted, and the sign was a strange star. Book of Creation 4.6 The star grew and waxed to a great brightness and was awesome to behold. It put forth horns and sang, being unlike any ever seen. So men, seeing it, said unto themselves, Surely this is God appearing in the heavens above us. But the star was not God though it was directed by his design, but the people had not the wisdom to understand it. No, Phoenix is said in the Nag Hammadi text to be from God, a weapon against the rulers of this world. Phoenix always appears as a red star in the heavens before it gets huge and fills up the sky looking like a red dragon. Now, Book of Creation 4.8 such was the likeness and manifestation of God in those days. Awesome was his countenance, terrible his voice of wrath. The sun and moon hid themselves in fear, and there was a heavy darkness over the face of the earth. Remember the Genesis text in the very beginning. This is what this is describing. Genesis says, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Now, creation, book of creation 4.9. Great fires and smoke rose up from the ground and men gasped for air. The land was rent asunder and swept clean by a mighty deluge of waters. A hole opened up in the middle of the land. The waters entered and it sank beneath the seas. Book of Creation 4.10. The mountains of the east and west were split apart and stood up in the midst of the waters, which raged about. The north land tilted and turned over on its side. Now, what is being described here is the 3895 B.C. lithospheric displacement. It is the only time the crust of the earth has actually moved and slipped over the mantle and recorded in, in, in traditional history. In histories that we know that there are traditions of when people were here and remembered these things. Now, this was year one of the pre-flood world's 1656 years. It was started by a pole ship caused by Phoenix in May 3895 B.C. Now, the Book of Creation 411. Then again, the tumult and clamor ceased, and all was silent. In the quiet stillness, madness broke out among men. Frenzy and shouting filled the air. They fell upon one another in senseless, wanton bloodshed. 
Neither did they spare women or child, for they knew not what they did. They ran unseeing, dashing themselves to destruction. They fled to caves and were buried, and, taking refuge in trees, they were hung. There was rape, murder, and violence of every kind. Some of the people were saved upon the mountainsides, uh, upon the flotsam, but they were scattered far apart over the face of the earth. They fought for survival in the lands of uncouth people. Amid coldness, they survived in caves and sheltered places. Now, <clears throat> Book of Creation 4.14 The land of the little people and the land of the giants, the land of the necklace ones and the land of marshes and mists, the lands of the east and west were all inundated. The mountain land and the lands of the south, where there is gold and great beasts, were not covered by the waters. There were less than children in those days and could not know that God had afflicted the earth in understanding and not willfully for the sake of man and the correction of his ways. Sounds to me that almost the entire world uh, flooding was experienced everywhere but the continent of Africa, which is interesting because Lenormand and several historians in the 18, I mean the early uh, 19th century were convinced that flood traditions were known all around the world and the only race that had absolutely no traditions of a great flood were the African. Very interesting. <clears throat> in the book of creation 416, we read, The earth is not for the pleasure of man, but it is a place of instruction for his soul. A man, a man more readily feels the stirrings of his spirit in the face of disaster than in the lap of luxury. The tuition of the soul is a long and arduous course of instruction and training. Sounds like reincarnation theology to me. Rebirth and simulation till the soul is ready to exit. Now, we get to the next book in the Colburn Bible. It's called the Book of Gleanings. In the Book of Gleanings 415, we read, The remnants of the sons of Nazira remained upon the mountains which are against Ardis by the land about the encampment of Lamech. In Ardis, there were wise men filled with inner wisdom who read the book of heaven with understanding and knew the signs. They saw the deeds of men in all the lands about the mountains and how it brought, and how it brought them to that hour. Then the day came when the Lady of the Night changed her garment for one of a different hue, and her form swept more swiftly across the skies. Her tresses streamed out behind in gold and copper, and she rode in a chariot of fire. The people in those days were a great multitude, and a loud cry ascended into heaven. Now, for a little context, after the pole shift, the new vapor canopy alters the appearance of the moon, human population explosion among lunar worshippers, and a smaller group of wise men and artists, which is referenced in the Book of Enoch as the origin of the watchers who brought civilization to the pre-flood people. Lamech sounds to me very close to the Sumerian pre-flood city of Larak, or Hebrew pre-flood name Lamech. Now, in the Book of the Gleanings, 416, we read, Then the wise men... The wise men went to Sharapik, now called Serapesh, and said to Sisuda the king, Behold, the years are shortened, and the hour of, hour of trial draws nigh. The shadow of doom approaches this land because of its wickedness. Yet, because you have not mingled with the wicked, you are set apart and shall not perish. This, so your seeds may be preserved. Then the king sent for Hanok, son of of Hogarater, and he came out of Ardis, for there he had heard a voice among the reeds, saying, Abandon your abode and possessions, for the hour of doom is at hand, neither gold nor treasure, but a reprieve, by a reprieve. Now, again for context, described here is the pre-flood city of Shurapak, mentioned so many times in ancient Sumerian and Babylonian records, and Hanok is a reference to Kanok or Henok, who we know of in the biblical record is Enoch, before the flood who came down from Ardis, which is mentioned in the book of Enoch, the flood who sailed from the homeland to arrive in Sumer with the knowledge of civilization. Enoch led the watchers, but in Sumerian, Enki led the Anuna. Both arrived by ship with the ingredients of civilization right after a cataclysm. Now, in the Book of the Gleanings 423, we read the king had entered, and with those of his own blood, and all fourteen in all, for it was fourteen that his house, that his household went into the ship. Of all the people who entered with him. Two understood the ways of the sun and moon, and the ways of the year and the seasons. One, the quarrying of stones. One, the making of bricks. And one, the making of axes and weapons. One, the playing of musical instruments. One, bread. One, the making of pottery. 
won the care of gardens and won the carving of wood and stone. Won the making of roofs, won the making working of timbers, won the making of cheese and butter, won the growing of trees and plants, won the making of plows, won the weaving of cloth and making dyes, won the brewing of beer, won the felling and cutting of trees, won the making of chariots, won dancing, won the mysteries of the scribes, won the building of houses and the working of leather. There was one skilled in the working of cedar and willow wood. He was a hunter, one who knew the cunning of games and circus. He was a watchman. There was an inspector of water and wells, a magistrate and a captain of men. There were three servants of God. There was Hanok and his brother and their household, and Divin and six men who were strangers. Now, what we have here is Enoch brought technology to Sumer. The list of trades is echoed in the book of Enoch concerning the knowledges that the watchers gave to humanity in exchange for their daughters. Now... Now is detect, detected a lacuna in the text, either a missing removed section or the narrator jumps straight to the next appearance of Phoenix, the Great Flood. He went from flood to flood. Okay, in the Book of Gleanings 424, then with the dawning, men saw an awesome sight. There, riding on a black rolling cloud, came the destroyer, newly released from the confines of the sky vaults, and she raged about the heavens, for it was her day of judgment. The beast with her opened its mouth and belched forth fire, hot stones, and a vile smoke. It covered the whole sky, and the meeting place of earth and heaven could no longer be seen. In the evening, the places of the stars were changed. They rolled across the sky to new stations. Then the floodwaters came. The Book of Enoch also describes a minor pole shift. Not total lithospheric displacement as happened in 3895 B.C. or year one of the pre-flood world. The new heavens and the new earth, uh, the vapor canopy world beginning. This was this was a temporal pole shift. There was no crustal displacement. With this passage in the book of the Gleanings, chapter four, we arrive at the great deluge, 2239 B.C., the month of May. In 425, we read the floodgates of heaven were opened and the foundations of earth broke apart. The surrounding waters poured over the land and broke upon the mountains. The storehouses of the winds burst their bolts asunder, so storms and whirlwinds were loose to hurl themselves upon the earth. In the seething waters and howling gales of buildings were destroyed. Trees were uprooted, mountains cast down. There was a time of great heat. Then came bitter cold. The waves over the waters did not rise and fall, but seethed and swirled. There was an awful sound above. Note that sound again. A phenomenon of Phoenix is the deafening roar in the sky. Book of the Gleanings 426. The pillars of heaven were broken and fell down to earth. The sky vault was rent and broken. The whole of creation was in chaos. The stars in the heavens were loosened from their places, so they dashed about in confusion. There was a revolt on high. A new ruler appeared there and swept across the sky in majesty. The destroyer passed away into the fastness of heaven, and the great flood remained seven days, diminishing day by day as the waters drained away to their places. Then the waters spread out calmly, and the great ship drifted amid a brown scum and debris of all kinds. Authenticity is lent to this account because it references anciently well-documented flood details, but does not cite any known texts, showing that this is an original composition. Now, in the Book of Gleanings 429, after many days the great ship came to rest upon Cardu in the mountains of Ashtar, against Nishim in the land of God. This is Mount Ararat in Turkey. Now we get to the third book. In the Colburn Bible, we get to the Book of Scrolls. In the Book of Scrolls 33:23, we read, We had been told the ways of men from olden times, but we heeded not the warning. 33:24. Now the truth is scattered to the four quarters of the earth. 33:25. These writings have been rewritten with diligent care. They have been transcribed exactly as they are, and no thought or belief of mine has gone into them. May, may those to whom they come as a heritage be no less circumspect in dealing with them. Book of the Sons of Fire They came from the temple of the lake dedicated to the bright-bearded one, who once saved earth from destruction through fiery hail by making a third round. This is an obscure statement. It mentions a savior, a bearded person, implying the saved were smooth skinned with no facial hair. And this is a very common denominator as known in many of my other videos. The Book of Manuscripts. 
Chapter 1, Scroll of Emod. It begins, The writings from olden days tell of strange things and of great happenings in the times of our fathers who lived in the beginning. All men can know of such times is, de is declared in the Book of Ages. But the gods had their birth in events and things which were in the beginning time. Chapter 3, The Destroyer, Part 1. This is, exact, this is the same book, Book of Manuscripts. Men forget the days of the destroyer, only the wise know where it went, and that it will return at its appointed hour. Book of Manuscripts 3.2 It raged across the heavens in the days of wrath, and this is its likeness. It was as a billowing cloud of smoke and wrapped in a ruddy glow, not, in, not distinguishable in joint or limb. Its mouth was an abyss from which came flame, smoke, and hot cinders. When ages pass, certain laws operate upon the stars in the heavens. Their ways change. There is movement and restlessness. They are no longer constant, and a great light appears redly in the skies. Redly in the skies. Phoenix appears initially as a strange red star. Remember that. Same book, chapter 3, verse 4. When blood drops upon the earth, the destroyer will appear, and mountains will open up and belch forth fire and ashes. Trees will be destroyed, and all living things engulfed. Waters will be swallowed up by the land and sea, and the sea will boil. There it is again. Red rains, blood rains are a phoenix phenomenon. Nibiru records have never yielded a similar description. Now, 3.5. The heavens will burn brightly and redly. There will be a copper hue over the face of the land, followed by a day of darkness. A new moon will appear and break up and fall. 3.6. The people will scatter in madness. They will hear the trumpet and battle cry of the destroyer and will seek refuge within dens in the earth. Terror will eat away at their hearts. Their courage will flow from them like water from a broken pitcher. They will be eaten up in the flames of wrath and consumed by the breath, the breath of the destroyer. Here is a very interesting prophecy text, the only prophecy that I found in all of the Colburn Bible, and it's a prophecy that's very relative to the Phoenix research. In the book of Manuscripts 3.7 we read, Thus it was in the days he of heavenly wrath which have gone, and thus it will be in the days of doom when it comes again. The times of its coming and going are known unto the wise. There are the signs of times which shall precede the destroyer's return. A hundred and ten generations shall pass in the west, and nations will rise and fall. Men will fly in the air as birds, and swim in the seas as fishes. Men will talk peace with one another. Hypocrisy and deceit shall have their day. Women will be as men, and men will be as women. Passion will be a plaything of man. Men shall be divided by their races, and the children will be born as strangers among them. Brothers shall strive with brother and husband against wife. Fathers will no longer instruct their sons, and the sons will be wayward. Women will become the common property of man, and will no longer be held in high regard and respect. Book of the Manuscript 310. In those days, men will have the great book before them. Wisdom will be revealed. The few will be gathered for a stand. It is the hour of trial. The dauntless ones will survive. The stout-hearted will not go down in destruction. The, of course, evidently, there will be people who are awakened in the last day who will survive the phoenix return with little loss. The text continues. O mortal men who wait without understanding... Where will you hide yourselves in the dread days of doom, when the heavens shall be torn apart and the skies rent in twain, in the days when children will turn gray-headed? This is the thing which will be seen. This is the terror your eyes will behold. This is the form of destruction that will rush upon you. There will be a great body of fire, the glowing head with many mouths and eyes ever-changing. Terrible teeth will be seen in formless mouths, and a fearful dark belly will grow redly from fires inside. Even the most stout-hearted man will tremble, and his bowels will be loosened, for this is not a thing understandable to men. The Book of Manuscripts, Chapter 5, Verse 1. The doom shape called the destroyer in Egypt was seen in all lands thereabouts. In color it was bright and fiery, in appearance changing and unstable. It twisted about itself like a coil, like water bubbling into a pool from an underground water supply. And all men agree it was the most fearsome sight. It was not a great comet or a loosened star, being more like a fiery body of flame. Its movements on high were slow, 
below it swirled in the manner of smoke, and it remained close to the sun, whose face it hid. Remember, Phoenix routinely hides the sun. There was a bloody redness about it, which changed as it passed along its course. It caused death and destruction in its rising and setting. It swept the earth with a gray cinder rain and caused many plagues, hunger, and other evils. It bit the skin of men and beasts until they became mottled with sores. The earth was troubled and shook. The hills and mountains moved and rocked. The, the dark smoke-filled heavens bowed over earth, and a great howl came to the ears of living men, borne to them upon the wings of the wind. It was the cry of the Dark Lord, the Master of Dread. Thick clouds of fiery smoke passed before him, and there was an awful hail of hot stones and coals of fire. The doom shape thundered sharply in the heavens and shot out bright lightnings. The channels of water were turned back unto themselves when the land tilted, and great trees were tossed about and snapped like twigs. Then a voice like ten thousand trumpets was heard over the wilderness, and before its burning breath the flames parted. The whole of the land was moved, and mountains melted. The sky itself roared like ten thousand lions in agony, and bright arrows of blood sped back and forth across its face. Earth swelled up like, like bread upon the hearth. It, now, the introduction of the term doom shape leads another layer, of, it pretty much lends another layer of credibility to the antiquity of this narrative. Original description of a historically known object, doom shape. Now, in the book of Manuscripts, chapter 5, verse 4, this is what we have. This was the aspect of the doom shape, called the destroyer, when it appeared in days long gone by in olden times. It is thus described in the old records, few of, few of which remain. It is said that when it appears in the heavens above, earth splits open from the heat like a nut roasted before the fire. Then flames shoot up through the surface and leap about like fiery fiends upon black blood. The moisture inside the land is all dried up. The pastures and cultivated places are consumed in flames, and they and all trees become white ashes. The doom shape is like a circling ball of flame which scatters small fiery offspring in its train. It covers about a fifth part of the entire sky and sends writhing snake-like fingers down to earth. Before it, the sky appears frightened and it breaks up and scatters away. Midday is no brighter than night. Remember, Phoenix chief attribute, dar attribute is darkening the sun. It spawns a host of terrible things. These are things said of the destroyer in the old records. Read them with solemn heart, knowing that the doom shape has its appointed time and will return. It would be foolish to let them go unheeded. Now, men say such things are not destined for our days, but they are wrong. Chapter 6, The Dark Days. Book of Manuscripts. Now, we see the phoenix visits, visits Egypt. This is the Exodus Cataclysm. Book of Manuscripts 6 1. The dark days begin with the last visitation of the destroyer, and they were foretold by strange omens in the skies. All men were silent and went about with pale faces. The leaders of the slaves, which had built the city to the glory of Thom, Thutmos, stirred up unrest, and no man raised his arm against him. They foretold great events of which the people were ignorant, and of which temple seers were not informed. These were days of ominous calm, when the people waited for they, they knew not. The presence of an unseen doom was felt. The hearts of men were stricken. Laughter was heard no more, and grief and wailing sounded throughout the land. Even the voices of children were stilled, and they did not play together, but stood silent. The slaves became bold and insolent, and women were the possession of any man. Fear walked the land, and women became barren with terror, for they could not conceive, and those with child aborted. All men closed up within themselves. The days of stillness were followed by a time when the noise of trumpeting and shrilling was heard in the heavens, and the people became as frightened beasts without a herdsman. The public records were cast forth and destroyed, and no man knew who were slaves and who were masters. The people cried out to Pharaoh in their distress, but he stopped his ears and acted like a deaf man. There were those who spoke falsely before Pharaoh, Pharaoh in those times, and had gods hostile towards the land. Therefore, the people cried out for their blood to appease it. But it was not these strange priests who put strife in the land instead of peace, for one was even of the household of Pharaoh and walked among the people unhampered. Dust and smoke clouds darkened the sky and colored the waters upon which they fell with a bloody hue. Plague was throughout the land. 
The river was bloody and blood was everywhere. The water was vile and men's stomachs shrank from drinking. Those who did drink from the river vomited it up for it was polluted. The dust tore wounds in the skin of man and beast. In the glow of the destroyer, the earth was filled with redness. Vermin bred and filled the air and face of the earth with lo loathsomeness. Wild beasts, afflicted with torments under the lashing sand and ashes, came out of their lairs in the wastelands and cave places and stalked the abodes of men. All the tame beasts whimpered, and the land was filled with the cries of sheep and moans of cattle. Trees throughout the land were destroyed, and no herb or fruit was to be found. The face of the land was battered and devastated by a hail of stones, which smashed down all that stood in the path of the torrent. They swept down in hot showers, and strange flowing fire ran along the ground in their wake. The fish of the river died in the polluted waters. Worms, insects, and reptiles sprang up from the earth in huge numbers. Great gusts of wind brought swarms of locusts which covered the sky. As the destroyer flung itself through the heavens, it grew great gusts of cinders across the land. The gloom of the long night spread a dark mantle of blackness which extinguished every ray of light. None knew when it was day or when it was night. Book of Manuscripts 615. The darkness was not the clean blackness of night, but a thick darkness in which the breath of men was stopped in their throats. Men gasped in a hot cloud of vapor. On the great night of the destroyer's wrath, when its terror was at its height, there was a hail of rocks and the earth heaved as pain rent her bowels. Gates, columns, and walls were consumed by fire, and the statues of gods were overthrown and broken throughout Egypt. People fled outside their dwellings in, in fear and were slain by the hail. Those who took shelter from the hail were swallowed when the earth split open. The habitations of men collapsed upon those inside, and there was panic on every, on every hand. But the slaves who lived in huts in the reed lands at the place of the pits were spared. The land writhed under the, under the wrath of the destroyer and groaned with the agony of Egypt. It shook itself, and the temples and palaces were destroyed. Even the great one, the firstborn of, of Pharaoh, died with the highborn, in the midst of the terror and falling stones. Children of princes were cast out into the streets, and those who were not cast out died within their abodes. There were nine days of darkness and upheaval, while a tempest raged such as never had been known before. When it passed away, Brother buried brother throughout the land. Men rose up against those in authority and fled from the cities to dwell in tents in the outlands. Egypt lacked great men to deal with the times. The people were weak from fear and bestowed gold, silver, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and copper upon the slaves. And to their priests they gave chalices, urns, and ornaments. Pharaoh alone remained calm and strong in the midst of the confusion. The slaves spared by the destroyer left the accursed land forthwith. Their multitude moved in the gloom of the half-dawn, under a mantle of fine swirling gray ash, leaving the burning fields and shattered cities behind them. Many Egyptians attached themselves to this host, for one who was great led them forth, a priest, a prince of the inner courtyard. Incredibly authentic reference to Moses is here without even mentioning his name, who in the Haggadah and in the Book of Jasher records was an Egyptian prince, a ruler and a former military commander, who was raised in the house of Pharaoh. None of the Jewish dressings are here, and they are as they are in the biblical Exodus text. We have here a description of a thriving multicultural civilization, a metropolis that totally falls apart. Not in ten mythical plagues like a Jewish drama, but as a prolonged cataclysm that totally ended the civilization in Egypt. The textual evidence in the Colburn manuscripts is of historical records composed independent of or before the Old Testament for which we have evidence was compiled only in the 3rd century BC. This is amazing. Now concerning the escaped slaves in the Book of Manuscripts 627, they turned before Nashari and stopped at Shokoth, the place of quarries. They passed the waters of Maha and came to the valley of Pikaroth toward the Mara. 
They came up against the waters which blocked their way, and their hearts were in despair. The night was a night of fear and dread, for there was high moaning above. The black winds from the underworld were loosed, and fire sprang from the ground. The hearts of the slaves shrank within them, for they knew the wrath of Pharaoh followed them, and that there was no way of escape. They hurled abuse upon those who led them. Strange rites were performed along the, along the shore. The slaves disputed among themselves, and there was violence. Pharaoh had gathered his army and followed the slaves. After he departed, there were riots and disorder behind him, for the cities were plundered. The laws were cast out of the judgment halls and trampled underfoot the streets. The storehouses and granaries were burst open and robbed. Roads were flooded and none could pass along them. People lay dead on every side. The palace was split and the princes and officials had fled so that none was left with authority to command. The lists of numbers were destroyed. Public places were overthrown and households became confused and unknown. Pharaoh pressed on in sorrow for behind him all was desolation and death. Before him were things he could not understand and he was afraid. But he carried on himself well and stood before his host with courage. He sought to bring back the slaves, for the people said their magic was greater than the magic of Egypt. The host of Pharaoh came upon the slaves by the saltwater shores, but was held back from them by a breath of fire. A great cloud was spread over the host and darkened the sky. None could see except for the fiery glow and the unceasing lightnings which rent the covering cloud overhead. A whirlwind arose in the east and swept over the encamped hosts. A gale raged all night, and in the red twi twilight dawn there was a movement of the earth. The waters receded from the seashore and were rolled back on themselves. There was a strange silence, and then in the gloom it was seen that the waters had parted, leaving a passage between. The land had risen, but it was disturbed and trembled. The way was not straight nor clear. The waters about were as if spun within a bowl, and swampland alone remained undisturbed. From the horn of the destroyer came a high, shrilling noise which stopped the ears of men. Now, the horn of Phoenix continuing to blast from the sky reveals that the parting of the Reed Sea was due to upheaval and the catastrophe, not a legendary Jewish Moses raising his staff to split the waters. Again, the Colburn, Colburn text is the more realistic. In the book of Manuscripts 632, we read, The slaves had been making sacrifices in despair. Their lamentations were loud. Now, before the strange sight, there was hesitation and doubt. For the space of a breath, they stood still and silent. Then, all confusion and shouting, some pressing forward into the waters. The fantastic copper plate engravings and works of art are about 380 years old and are all the work of Mathas Mirian de Altier, otherwise known as Matthew the Elder, born 430 years ago in the year 1593. He is considered as one of, he's the, one of the greatest of the copper plate artists ever. You can see, a lot of people see these old illustrations and they think they're pen and ink and they're not. They're, they're copper plate. These are engravings, they're very meticulously done. You can easily see here his attention to detail, symmetry, and perspective. Uh, the balance of, of light and shadow with nature, it, it's amazing. A true artist of both the human form, landscape, cartography, and architecture. Here in this picture you see a star fort in Europe which to me is no real mystery, as such a defensible zigzagging perimeter walls, it maximizes the ability of the defenders to strike attackers from multiple vantage points. Here his artwork was published in a music book. I have brought to your attention his penchant for accuracy, because it's important to understand that when we can, we need to understand that he was very, he was very, meticulous about detail because we're going to examine his alchemical masterpieces. In this chart by Matthew the Elder titled The Great Chain from God to Nature and from Nature to Man, we find that God is represented in the cloud in the Hebrew, a clue that alchemy had both hermetic and 
Kabbalic origins. The female here is Mother Nature, and she governs the celestial spheres where the zodiacal powers rest and the spheres of the sun and moon. She is chained to God, but below her, sitting on the world, is a monkey chained to her. The monkey in alchemy represents mankind because humans are the chief of the animals, the smartest. The monkey was regarded as being the closest to mankind, and there can be no doubt that the establishment after alchemy fell out of vogue, then invented the evolutionary model of humans descending from primates based on these older alchemical concepts. But in the alchemical treatises, humans were made perfect from the beginning. In these old charts, it is important to take note of the positioning of the astrological symbols, for these provide the viewer with an important date. This is the great meteorological chart that Matthew the Elder made in the year 1623. At the top, God is shown among the orders of the angels. Below, these are these on the left and on the right outside the celestial dome, these are the astrological programs that govern over the world. The one on the right, blown up here, is a date. The illustration reveals that tornadoes called turbos here in Latin, and windstorms, torrential rains, even rains of stones from the sky, and fire falling from the sky, these are all meant to chastise mankind. Several types of sky phenomena are found here, and they, are, they can be cross-referenced with the same unusual sky phenomena found in the Book of Wonders, as seen here. Comets that turn in the sky, clouds that burn like fire, and the fiery rods that sometimes look like burning logs in the sky. On the surface, historians tell us that these charts were describing meteorolo meteorological concepts, and indeed they are. However, the alchemical treatises have always exhibited on the surface what was otherwise hidden to all, save for the astute observer. At the bottom there is a man sleeping below a ribbon that reads, in Latin, Man is the perfection and end of all the creatures of the world. The idea is that the world existed prior to mankind, as did the animals, and God created mankind out of all the best ingredients taken from the animal kingdoms. This was divine alchemy. But mankind was made in the image of God, and God wasn't made from animal ingredients. So the deeper meaning here is that this chart is referring to the avatar and not the immortal spirit within. The avatar is a part of the animal world, subject to the phenomena of nature and the sky that both heals and harms the avatar. And this sleeping man represents the fact that mankind is asleep, living in a dream construct, a maya, a world of phenomena and not of fact. A modern example is the Matrix movie, with humans asleep and living out a dream in a construct. Centuries ago, no one had the frames of reference for Matrix or simulation or virtual reality or hollow field. The idea of superconstructions had already entered the ancient mindset a few times, but the concept was always later forgotten. The world was viewed as part of a larger mechanism, and in the alchemical masterpieces we see how these were conceptualized. Alchemical text and illustrations often used allegory and symbolism to convey complex ideas. The ultimate goal of alchemy was the great work, or the magnum opus, the process of transmuting base metals into gold, an allegory for understanding and basically manipulating the fundamental structure of reality to bring forth what you want. 
One needed the Philosopher's Stone to comprehend the great work. The souls of men were anciently referred to as stones. Soul and stone was interchangeable, like the pyramid, like the blocks of the Great Pyramid. On my t-shirt, 2.5 million blocks made this gigantic 454 foot high monument. But in antiquity, every single block represented a soul that was included in the monument of man. And when that monument is made complete, the chief cornerstone will descend. He is the philosopher's stone. He is the stone the builders rejected. Alchemy, it held that the microcosm, the, the individual, and the macrocosm, the whole universe, they mirrored one another, reflecting a reality that is interconnected and possibly constructed. Alchemy and Hermeticism are inextricably intertwined in this way, in this belief in a, in a microcosm and macrocosm, this belief that as above, so below. This amazing chart was published and made known to the world in the year 1626 in a book released by Robert Flood featured in Cosmic Meteorology. As many of you know, the year 1626 was a phoenix year on the 138 year chronology of phoenix resets and edits. And speaking of the phoenix, we cannot ignore this alchemical masterpiece made by Johann Daniel Milius, who had made this stunning piece just five years before Matthew the Elder did his own copper plate engraving. Both men were alive and making their copper plates at the exact same time. Here, the celestial realms are above the terrestrial with the unifying principles governed by astrology. A pyramid is at the middle of a concentric series of spheres. These are programs in astrology, a construct. In the world of men, this is governed by, by a strange 10-month zodiac having all avians, birds, dragons, and a phoenix. Directly below is a representation of Father Time holding two starry hatchets, representing day and night amidst a grove of astrology trees. The man and woman in this construct are chained to God, meaning there is a connection between them and the Oversoul that the rest of the beings in the construct do not share. As alchemy on the surface concerns turning base materials into something of value, then the deeper meaning is that this is spiritual alchemy, and these humans are avatars housing spirits chained to God. The construct is governed by polarities, day and night, fire and water, but the key to understanding and unlocking the construct itself is found in the cleverly hidden heptagrams found at the feet of the man and the lion at the left part of the chart. These are seven pointed stars that produce the pyramid angle in geometry and represent the keeping of time as I've shown in my published books and prior videos, the ancient Chaldean, the Celtic Druidic heptagrams as well as the Egyptian. Even Bonnie Gaunt in her books represents the heptagrams as showing the angle of the Great Pyramid itself. These seven pointed stars in the old Chaldean Babylonian uh, Babylonian cosmos in the it's it, it totally represented the seven days of the week and the seven epics of the world. These two heptagrams linked to the sun held which is held by the man and the lion, forms a perfect triangle, our pyramid. And in the center of the pyramid is clearly the word Phoenix. The Great Pyramid, the Phoenix, and keeping of the calendar are all right here in a chart showing humans in a construct but in no real danger because they are tethered 
to God. Only their avatars are subject to the polarities of the world. The immortal spirits within belong outside the construct where they are actually safe. Guys, Johannes Kepler was alive at this time. He saw these publications. He saw the older alchemical treatises. He saw the turnings of the spheres in many charts. The astrology charts that showed them basically the mechanics of our world. He was exposed to all of this. And what is interesting but almost never mentioned is the fact that that alchemy has been discredited as a scientific discipline, but our present model of the solar system with planets orbiting the sun was actually developed and built upon these older alchemical models of the medieval period that showed the wanderers or the astrological symbols in their own respective spheres. All going around the sun. And man did not descend from monkeys, my friends. No, it was evolution that descended from alchemy. The origin of Freemasonry is by the order claimed to have derived from ancient Egypt. Now, I don't know if that's true, but their oldest records do assert. I have read the Wood Manuscript. I've also read the Inigo Jones document. These are very old uh, 18th century documents uh, in Freemasonry. Now, uh, they mention Enoch and the pyramid and, and Abraham, and they're very interesting. In Egypt, at the city of Heliopolis, Lower Egypt, was the mansion of the Phoenix, where the Ben Ben stone was kept, which looks like a little pyramid. Now, a pyramidion. It's a small replica of both concepts of the pyramid and the capstone. The Ben Ben was associated to the Bennu bird, which you know of as the Phoenix. It was linked to the sun and to destruction, to cycles of rebirth. In the degrees of Freemasonry, the phoenix is the symbol for the 33rd degree. In fact, it was Freemasons that established the great seal of the United States of America to be on one side the Great Pyramid and on the other side the phoenix. From 1782 and on for uh, the next 120 years, until 1902, the Great Seal was of the Phoenix, but in 1902 it was quietly changed to the Eagle. The central theme of the Phoenix was of destruction that had become necessary, a purge that cleansed the world, then initiated a new start upon the ashes of the old. That's the Phoenix symbolism. This theme holds true with the Great Fire of London in 1666, when the city and the old cathedral were burnt and ruined. You have to understand, it was the fourth church that was already there. It's very old. The records go back to 604 AD in the city of London, that there was always a temple, church, or cathedral standing there. The ruin of the city initiated a massive rebuilding campaign. One of the new projects was to build a new cathedral on the grounds of the old one. Nine years after the Great Fire, the huge undertaking to build what we know of today as St. Paul's Cathedral in London, which is still standing today. It was built principally by the architect Sir Christopher Wren. It's the very first structure of its kind in London or England that had a dome. So, when the builders were gathering materials and laying out the lines, the measurements for for the deal, the architects uh, and the builders, one of the workers dropped a piece of an old gravestone that was found. I mean, they, they, they often used, uh, uh, in their building materials, they often used prior pieces to earlier structures. So, a piece fell down and... Sir Christopher Wren noticed there was writing on it, had it cleaned off, and saw the words, I think it's a resurgum, which is a Latin word, and he knew that it meant, I will rise again. It was an old gravestone. We are told that this is why the phoenix relief is found so prominently on the cathedral. I believe that's a cover story. I'm going to show you why. In St. Paul's Cathedral in London, was it was begun in 1675. And the structure, when it was finished, was 365 feet high. That's huge. 
The cathedral took 35 years to build and was finished in the year 1710. Thus, the completion of the famous cathedral was 330 years, 33 times 10, to the year 2040. AD, the return of the phoenix and the destruction of the building and London by extension. Remember, in prior videos I show you, Nostradamus's codified prophecies show that London and New York are destroyed together and it will be in the year 2040. 33 is the number associated over and over to the Freemasons. Uh, and basically their knowledge of the phoenix and the structuring of mechanical time. The association of time as being uh, basically a dimensional architecture, a product of the grand architect. This 2040 dating of the cathedral is further seen in that the structure was, was built to 365 feet in height and 365 years after its beginning when the ground was broken for the project in its first year of construction in 1675, which can be verified by anybody, 365 years exactly after 1675 is the year 2040. Now, Wikipedia cites its height at 364 feet. It's one, it's one foot off. London-based websites that describe the, the, the cathedral say that it's closer to 366 feet, although it's 365 feet. So it's 365 feet and some inches. And we know 365 feet was the intended height of the architects because it's the number of days in the year, and it's also the number of the great architect known in Freemasonry, Enoch. The St. Paul's Cathedral prophetically dates its own destruction in the year of the Phoenix, 2040 AD, as seen in, the, in this chart right here. 2040, you guys know it, especially my archaics veterans. I've already beat you up with this over and over and over and over. 2040, month of May, May 15th, May 16th, depending upon what hemisphere you live on, is the destruction caused by Phoenix. Now, proof that the structure is a countdown to its own destruction by the phoenix is found in that the southern facade of the cathedral shows everyone this sculpture right here. I'm going to let you look at that real close. Jason Brashears didn't make this up. St. Paul's Cathedral in London. These are the dates. This is the measurements. This is the picture that's shown prominently on the wall of the southern entrance. You just can't make this stuff up. It's the Phoenix. That 1710 was intended completion date of St. Paul's Cathedral was found in that it is precisely 396 years before the year 2106 AD. Again, my archaics veterans, you all know that date. It is the year 6000. No, the world is not 6000 years old, but a calendar did begin 5916 years ago. The Annus Mundi calendar, the Phoenix timeline. So, and it, and it, and it was started from a great reset, the new heavens and the new earth, better known as the Edenic story of the fall of man. So, anyway, this year, 2106, is on the Nemesis X timeline every 792 years. Remember, guys, I show you this chart. Look at this chart right here. Nemesis X object has a very unusual movement. It is away from our world for 732 years. But when it comes back, it's here for 60 years. And the year it appears and the year it departs is always something major in world history. The year it appears in the near future is 2046. The year it starts departing and leaving us is 2106. Now, I'll let you decide what all that means, but here's the chart. Totally independent data set here that lines up with this St. Paul's Cathedral finish date of 396 years, which is exactly half of 792 years, the Nemesis X timeline. It's all very, very compelling. So, remember, with the Great Pyramid itself is also, it's also one of these chronometrical prophecies. Remember, all the individual courses, look at this picture, all the individual courses starting in 1902, the key Phoenix year, all the individual courses count, 203 courses, all the way up to the very end of the pyramid, which is the flat top. It's the end because it's missing a capstone. 
the stone the builders rejected. It's not there. Not yet. But those 203 courses are 203 years from 1902, the end of the Cursed Earth calendar. 1902 plus 203 is 5,998 Annus Mundi. It is the year 2105 of our calendar, Anno Domini. One year is missing. One element of the Great Pyramid timeline is missing. In 2106, the return of the chief cornerstone completes the Monument of Man. And that's what all these calendars are pointing to. Now, chronal texture is real. It's a real phenomenon. I've, I've demonstrated it many times. I have shown that the ultimate symbol embodying the concept of time in this technosphere of holography is the Great Pyramid itself, the highest symbol of the Grand Architect. I have likewise proven my case. The scientific measurements done to a thousandth of an inch of the rectilinear dimensions of the Great Pyramid show this 138-year patterning all throughout the monument. So, it should come as no surprise that the Cathedral Church of St. Paul in the city of Boston in the United States is located at 138 Tremont Street in Boston. The address of the church in Boston, 138. Now, it was built in 1819. Both cities of St. Paul's cathedrals, London and Boston, are known for having suffered through great fires. In 1882, the gigantic Paul's Bell, weighing 32,000 pounds, was installed into the cathedral of St. Paul's in London. This was the 207th year since the founding in 1675 of the cathedral. 207 is half of 414, a cursed earth period, which is a phoenix timeline. I've showed you videos on that, especially my last video. My chart video was all about the cursed earth system. 414 is 138 times 3. So, in the, in the phoenix year of 1902... The Church of the Immaculate Conception was founded in the city of Phoenix, Arizona, in 1902. It would receive recognition and become St. Mary's Basilica. The founding of a church in this year at the location of a city called Phoenix is no coincidence. As many of you know, the perfect mathematical construct of the 138-year Phoenix phenomenon over so many millennia is what led me to really question nature. That there is a cleverly disguised mechanical aspect governing over seemingly random phenomena, providing us the illusion of natural order and not, not a controlled one. I am not the first to suspect this. On the cover of one of my prior videos about machines in the sky, as you see here, it's a famous woodcut that appeared in Flammarion's book for the very first time in the year 1888. Now, it is admitted that no one knows the origin of this woodcut. This was just the first time that it was published in a book that we have a record of. So, let's look closer at this piece and see what it's conveying. It is clear the artist understood that the sun, moon, and stars were inside the vault of the sky and that this sky totally hid what was actually present beyond. For the 1800s, the artist did a good job of conveying a very mechanical beyond the sky uh, scene. Smoke, fire, other gigantic glowing objects like the sun and moon, but different. The man in the woodcut is peering through the illusory sky at what lies beyond. And the most curious detail in the realm above the sky is the wheel within a wheel. Wheels from ancient times were associated with mechanical devices. For this reason, when mysterious constructions were seen in the skies long ago, they were referred to as flying chariots, which are wheeled constructions. They merely employed frames of reference available to them. In other presentations, I showed that super constructions have been described by eyewitnesses in history. Over a century ago, Charles Fort wrote that super constructions appeared in our skies every once in a while, and he even theorized that some may be inhabited or they may be derelict. 
still carrying out the functions or a program designed by an ancient race that may no longer exist. Fort was certainly before his time. There appeared to be instances when the sky sim failed and the loss of power weakened the holo field, allowing people to see constructions in the sky that had been previously hidden. In the year 1561, then in 1566, both of them over Nuremberg and Basel, Europe. Again, 1752, I have a whole video about the appearance of a glowing octagonal object and the phenomena that it created both in the sky and on the ground. In this Nuremberg picture, the great black spear appears to be a gigantic vessel and the sun appears weakened as objects appeared all around it or maybe through it. A bladed track appears behind the sun. It's so, so bizarre. And the sky is filled not with mere globular objects, but long rods and giant pipes with lights and spindles, as well as flying crosses. For a while, a gigantic object appeared near the sun and had its own corona. In the Old Testament, this wheel-within-a-wheel phenomenon in the sky is recorded in the book of Ezekiel. In chapter 1, verse 16, we read very clearly, as for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl, and the four had the same likeness. Their appearance and construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. This, if true, happened over 25 centuries ago. And again, the wheel is a reference, is a frame of reference. The best approximation that the eyewitness could contrive for the time period. A short time ago, an archaic subscriber named Dennis sent me an account I had never seen before, which is not uncommon. I mean, no one has read all the historical records there are, and no one could. But in this, in this 1764 article, A Phoenix Year, that we find, we find this account, and it reads... A true and wonderful narrative of two entire particular phenomena which were seen in the sky in Germany, Philadelphia, in 1764. This is what the article says. This was a Phoenix year. We hear with the greatest astonishment that near Riga in Livonia, Livonia has been seen the open sky, a fiery rod which struck about it, and the points of the rod were full of blood. Four great swords stood in the starry heaven, which very often vanished, and soon appeared again, then did strike together like flashes of fire round a house, and it was very frightful to behold. Likewise was to be seen with horror a pretty large coffin in the sky, which was covered with three dead heads, also a pyramid and a serpent. These are the forebodings of the Creator which go before punishment. A sky-born youth in white, pro in white proclaimed to the multitude near Riga amid the thunderous lightning and apparitions of swords and snakes and skulls. In the, in the town of Kirschberg, outside Dansk, a three-day sail from Riga along the Baltic southern shore, similar vengeful scenes were also reported in the skies. For a full 48 hours, the tempest fiery red clouds alternately closed and then opened and revealed a cannon and swords in the sky, along with three angels enjoining citizens to quit their vice and unrighteousness, or God will punish you very quick. So opens the first two accounts detailing unusual phenomena. I, it's hard to make, make anything out of that, but these were seen in the skies over, over is Riga or Riga, Kirschberg near Dansk in the month of May of 1763. So, it was published in Mannheim, born Philadelphia, by a man named Anton Armbruster, or Armbruster, uh, the following year. Again, these serpents, pyramids, heads, coffins, they're all just frames of reference. When people witness unfamiliar objects, the pattern recognition faculty of the human mind instantly tries to associate what is seen with what is known. It wasn't a coffin, but an immense superconstruction, not an hourglass or a wheeled cannon. 
In more ancient times, it would have been described as a wheeled chariot. We have, we have here a weakening of the sky sim, which allows for observers to see what has been there all along. These staves, pipes, pillars, swords in the sky, they are all a part of a vast apparatus. In 1346 and 1347, they were described as giant cigar-shaped vessels in the sky that spread the plague that killed one-third of the race, known as the Great Black Death, as I revealed in this video here. Modern interpretation has every object in the sky described anciently as a sword to be a comet, and this is patently untrue. Here is a picture of the sun being sickened, injured, having a black eye as a comet appears on one part of the sky and a sword appears in the other. Remember the giant black spear that, that, that hovered over Nuremberg. It could very well have been described as a sword. Now here's a woodcut from the year 1687. What do you see? On the left there is a skull in the sky. On the right there is an arc or a coffin and between them is a comet. And here is a 16th century woodcut depicting something in the sky in the year 1479 over Basel, Switzerland. Today we are told it's a comet, but does it look like a comet? Or does it look as though the artist was attempting to show a superconstruction half visible as if partially obscured by maybe something in the sky or the sky sim itself? Who knows? But it doesn't look like a comet to me. The idea that chariots were in the sky was simply the acceptance of an unknown mechanical aspect to sky phenomena. A Nuremberg woodcut from the year 1504 so it shows clearly that the sky is a star-filled vault and that the zodiac ring is inclined to the ecliptic and is also inside the vault. This explains the common theme of astrolabs centuries ago actually depicted as a wheel within a wheel. Look at these examples. It is instantly noticeable that our world is displayed at the very center and small with wheels within wheels providing an outer construct from which all visible phenomena was perceived. Stars, constellations, a sun and moon. Remember guys, I've explained over and over that we are in the simulacrum. We are in the center of it. And the further we look out from the center at everything, it provides for us a beautiful sky full of a cosmos, but it's all, the, it's all a hollow field on the inside of a construct. We're not actually seeing beyond whatever the shell is, the Dyson, Dyson sphere-like shell construct that we're contained in. This seems to be the idea conveyed in old art. In the year 1503, Urania would cut the construct was overseen right here by the goddess. In 1559, Cunningham version, it was Atlas that supported the construct. And in the 1596 engraving depicting Kepler's Platonic universe, we find the construct is made of geometrical dimensions surrounding our world. Maybe it was the 1763 constructions that appeared in the sky that prompted this painting from the year 1763 in Germany. I don't know, but the imagery is of angels, light, a construction at the top, and a horn. Horn... Horns, they're associated to flying constructions, and they are found also in this, in this 1618 artwork from Germany. Remember, too, the phoenix phenomenon is accompanied by a horn blast sound, and in the apocalypse, it is horns that issue in a lot of the judgments against the, the, the condemned. So it appears that there has long been the idea that the sun and the moon were not the only objects in the sky that there, are something, there was something else, something hidden. It has been the subject of over 50 of my own videos and three published books to show you that this hidden object in our sky is a super construction and that it has always been referred to as the Sky Dragon, the Typhon, Fenrir, the Fink, Nof, and Phoenix, the Thunderbird. Also, it is specifically attached to the idea of the Pyramid. Look at this artwork, a very mechanical sky with a pyramid in the center and two birds in the sky, but not in the, in the central field. On the right, 
is a is Aquila or the Eagle, and on the left is the Phoenix. Phoenix is written clear enough to read. Below are a man and woman naked leaving the garden and the tree of life, or Axis Mundi. And in the beginning, it was the appearance of the fiery flaming sword, or the phoenix in the year 3895 BC, that ended a prior world so completely that the few survivors thought it was a new heavens and a new earth. Therefore, Genesis has it as a creation account. But those who do a deep dive into the, into the text of Genesis can easily see that it's a recreation. Mankind was told to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is supposed to be the creation event. The eagle, the eagle is the symbol of rulership. It would be balanced with the phoenix, which is the, the, it's the symbol of destruction and rebirth as mankind moves through the dolmen portal seen below with their ultimate destination being the great pyramid as seen above the dolmen in the geometry. Until mankind is ready, the forces of the eagle, which are the rulers of this world, and the, and the phoenix would maintain balance. My videos in the Lost Secrets of Giza playlist explain everything mentioned here. This, this one illustration is very telling. In fact, this is not an isolated piece of imagined or, or, or an imagined interpretation. Look at this mechanical looking representation of sky phenomena of sun, stars, and moon constellations with a pyramid in the center. At the bottom right, the devil is tempting Eve, who holds the moon. From this union of Baphomet and the goddess came Aquila, or the eagle, or the rulership of the world. On the far left is man. Adam, representing the Adamu, or mankind, who is watched over by the phoenix. You, you clearly read the word phoenix and see the bird below him. Both mankind and the elite are seen in this depiction, chained to the wheels of the sky. The phoenix and the pyramid being key to understanding the operation of the construct and decoding history was known centuries ago, disguised by the elite in the alchemical traditions. This 1718 copper plate piece shows that the phoenix held a prominent place in the sky with the sun and moon. Notice the pyramid in the ground. And in my prior video about the octagonal star of 1752, I demonstrated that it was mathematically linked to other phoenix phenomenon dates. And in this 1752 uh, AD art by an unknown al alchemist, we again find the phoenix as a body in the sky with the sun and moon. And look at this artwork. The phoenix is prominent again and hidden behind the stars. In this old alchemical illustration, what do you see here? I see the blindness of mankind represented at the bottom. But truth can be found in the rabbit hole. See the rabbits and the man at the hole at the bottom? Why is truth found in the underground? This picture shows that knowledge and architecture and people are preserved underground. How much? How many times have I told you guys on my channel, showing you different pieces of evidence, that libraries and artifacts and inventions and concepts are preserved in underground facilities, and after Phoenix resets, they're brought back up to the surface? How many times have I shown that? How many times have I theorized that or produced evidence of that? Here it is in a picture. So, this building with people in it is underneath the mountain, and they are under the phoenix. These are the elite. In this Freemason art, we see that there is a third object recognized in the sky and symbolized as the triangle or pyramid with an eye. I have shown this to be the phoenix. And for any who would contend this, who disbelieve or think that it's creative license, I offer the following. Check out this illustration, showing Freemason ideas came from the older alchemical treatises. In this piece, we see the eye in the triangle watching over mankind is in fact the phoenix.
And this leads us to a better understanding of the great seal of the United States, the great pyramid and the eye. And remember, I have explained in my books and videos, the U.S. government quietly changed the great seal of the United States from the Phoenix to the Eagle in the year 1902, which was a Phoenix year. It's 138 years to the year 2040. I've shown, this, I've shown you guys this many times. And this was done because the elite understand they understood in 1902 they had 138 more years before the Phoenix would seek them out. They had been given a pass for many centuries. But they know in 2040 the beginning of the end of their dominion will unfold. A man named Les Scarbolt, he claimed that he had observed an unknown body close to the sun in the year 1859. I know many of you know that, that year. This discovery was announced at the Academy of Scientists by Leverer. William Corliss wrote that many famous astronomers, they subsequently saw this planetary object. So many, in fact, that it received its honorary name as Vulcan in the astronomical tables. Not, not pseudo-astronomy. These were the, the highest elite astronomers of the day. The discovery was a sensation and immediately, immediately several previous discoveries were brought back to the table. Now, in 1761, the astronomer Schuter, I believe he was from Holland, maybe Dutch, uh, he documented his uh, observation of the mystery object near the sun in Venus. In 1762, Stoddacker saw an object in that area, and he wrote a note to himself that it might be a, plant, a new planet, a hitherto unknown world. He wrote that in his own astronomical minutes. Also, the, uh, the astronomer, I believe it's pronounced Lichtenberg, but he watched a large black dot pass over the sun's surface. And in 1764, everybody knows this. I've said this at least 100 times in all my presentations, all my videos, all my posts, all my articles, and all my published books. 1764, astronomer Hoffman, in the month of May, observed a dark object, like a sphere, cover one-fifth uh, one of the sun's surface. Now, in order to do that, it had to have been very, very local. There's nothing in the system, assuming the system is not just a hologram. So there's nothing in the system at large. Now, uh, that was the year, 1764. It was a Phoenix year connected to 1902, connected to 2040. So it's very interesting that we have this scientific, this scientific record in 1764. Now, to cover a, a fifth of the sun's surface meant it was either very close or extremely large. All of these sightings, though, these are found... Oh, uh, page 48, just reading it this morning. I mean, I've read this book like two other times before. I'm, I'm going to read it again. These are, all, these are all found on page two, on page 48. This is William Cordes' collection of scientific reports, Mysterious Universe, a handbook of astronomical anomalies. The book, the book is packed with nothing but scientific reports. They're not chronologically arranged. They're arranged by subject matter. This whole chapter is on the Vulcan, the Vulcan object of the 1800s that mystified astronomers. It's really, really, I'm going to keep it open for some notes here, but uh, it's really a fantastic, a fantastic read. If you're, a, you know, if you're a nerd, if you really get off into this type of material. But all of them are found right here on page 48. It must be understood that these were not the first scientific reports at all. In the year 1672, an astronomer observed an object near Venus. It was 14 years later that the same astro astronomer in the year 1686 saw the exact same thing. He observed it again. But this time, he was, very, he was paid very close attention to because several other astronomers in 1686 also saw it in the same year. So... They saw, they saw a large black object pass over the, the disk of the sun. So it was very close to Venus, while Venus transited as well. So these were dismissed 80 years later, though, in 1766, 
uh, by a VN observatory astronomer simply who simply declared that oh you know what that, that stuff wasn't true that was just they were, those were optical illusions back then that's how they dismissed things they didn't want to entertain today they do it a different way they call them artifacts artifacts or pieces of dust on your lens and stuff like that but the dismissal is popular with uh, academia so only when observations conform with the popular paradigm are the objects not deemed as artifacts so that this discovery was made in 1859 is not without significance. Something unusual, hidden in the sky, that is about to approach, it would be more visible. So, on September 1st, 1859, we have, and I've covered this in prior presentations, we have the Carrington event. I have shown the weird things that happened in that event in a prior video, and I just... It's, it, it boggles the mind that all these other presentations that I've come across and all these other videos and these articles and published reports all mentioning the Carrington event, I have never yet, until I read William Cordes, ever associated the Carrington event with the very fact that that was the year the scientific community finally entered into their minutes, the Vulcan. Now remember, I've told you guys in prior presentations, man, the Vulcan is the phoenix. So, but you know, you know, we sheep have been told it was a coronal mass ejection, X flares that fried out telegraph wires, started fires in many locations, caused strange auroras. We've been told all kinds of BS. But in 1859, the sighting and announcement in the scientific journals, they basically have reignited an entire search across the, the field of astronomy for the Vulcan object. It was all the craze of the time. Professor Watson, in July 1878, during the Great American Eclipse, he observed Vulcan pass over the surface of the sun. 1878 illustration of the coronal, uh, the corona, that was that was basically documented in 1878 during the eclipse. It is absolutely identical to the artistic woodcut we find describing what was in the sky 317 years earlier over Nuremberg in the year 1561. Now. Compare these pictures. The only problem here is that the woodcut of 1561, the sun is off to the side looking injured. So something else appeared in the sky as equally large of the, as the sun and also provided its own corona. It, whatever the second object was, it was eclipsed too. This is exactly what these pictures show us. So they're 317 years apart. Now look, now look at the Cautious Woodcut of 1561. The Cautious Woodcut, I have already done a video about this event as well. And this strange machinery type sky that was visible with the gigantic black super construction that looked like a giant, it looked like a giant black star, I mean a black spear that was just passing over this slowly. As all this phenomena was erupting in the sky and people were seeing not blue sky anymore, but they were seeing the sun appear as something else. And then all of a sudden these orbs appear and these strange shapes appeared among them. Things were moving forward and backward out of in and out of perspective while this opaque black spear-like super construction just floated across the sky. That may have, that might have been the phoenix. I don't know. But it's all, it's, all very, it's all very intriguing that all these things tie in together here with these appearances of Vulcan 1859. So, these pictures looking identical but made 317 years apart, they reveal to us how much we really do not know about our sky and what the beautiful holography above us actually conceals from our sight. So in 1884, the director of the Royal Observatory of Brussels suggested that the object was not a moon of Venus, but a hitherto unknown planet. Here is another major astronomer taking under serious, serious consideration that Vulcan is real and it's inside our system. So, if there are so many sightings of the Vulcan, and this object was acknowledged in the early scientific reports, then why have you not heard about this mystery object? Albert Einstein is the reason. Einstein's theory was based off his mathematical construct that was supposed to explain the mechanics of gravity. Now, but from its inception, it could not account for non-locality, it couldn't account for superluminal bodies, or the quantum phenomena of the very universe that it was supposed to explain. 
There were many, many brilliant minds of the time. Planck is one of them. You've heard the Planck constant. Planck was one of them. There, I mean, there's so many. And Einstein was chosen for a reason. So let's look at him real quick to understand what's really going on. In 1900, Einstein graduated as a teacher of math and physics. But his own professors are recorded to have thought very low of him. They just didn't see that he, that he had what it took. That's very telling. Nothing Jason's making up. It's in the historical record. So, in, in 1901, Einstein acquired Swiss citizenship and was completely broke. By 1902, his family went bankrupt. The lowest point in his life, according to his biographers. And he tutored children to make money. But he even got fired from those jobs as well. So in 1903, Einstein got a job permanently with the Swiss Patent Office in Bern. Yeah, he gets, he gets a, a, a job at the Patent Office. You know what's passing through the Patent Office, right? Yeah. This is an accusation that's been leveled against many great men who became famous for something they themselves did not, did not create. Scientifically, Einstein was a nobody. Nobody in 1903, but in 1905, he published four papers, one on special relativity, for which was the very foundation of his theory, and even his biographers claim in their writings about Albert Einstein that 1905 was Einstein's miracle year. Yeah, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it was his miracle year. I'm buying it that it was a miracle that he was chosen to do what happened. Now, Remember, guys, this was apparently the miracle time for the elite as well, unleashing hundreds of companies and corporations that all still exist today as Fortune 500 companies that own thousands of other companies, huge umbrella corporations that didn't start any time in, the relative, in relative near history. They all started in 1901, 1902, and 1903, and I have shown this, and you guys have helped me show a lot more you know, by sending me all your discoveries as well. So... We have a, what I am proposing is that Einstein's, his ideas filled a need by the academic community, a model that they could use to promote ideas that, that basically, to promote ideas they liked while dismissing the naysayers. I'm proposing that Einstein's theory of special and general relativity is not accurate because we exist in a holo field that abides by its own laws. I am proposing that Einstein was a fraud and that it was easy to search for all those other scientists. Right now it's easy. It's so easy to search for all those other scientists all over the world who at that time from 1903 to 1919 when Einstein was being groomed to, to fill this role. They totally disagree with Einstein, but they paid the price. After a while, the detractors, they learned real quick to remain silent. The scientific community is a cult, and the effect of adopting this theory explains a lot. Einstein's theory of general relativity was adopted by the scientific community, which then allowed them to use this new model to dismiss all enigmas that were then being discovered by Bernard and other troublesome astronomers. Yes, Bernard is another one that I have, I, he's in other prior presentations. Some of you remember I have documented about Bernard Star and about the dark object in the Cygnus Rift that Bernard has seen. Yeah, they made him rewrite his minutes to say dark nebulae. But he saw a dark, dark, opaque object, like a planet. So, scientific community's full of shit. They always have been. So, the academic overseers, they needed a theory of everything that could act as a governor over all scientific analysis. A filtering system that could be used to support the heliocentric model of, model of the system while also editing out all the data that didn't conform to the model. Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, relativity it's just, it wasn't accepted by all scientists. It still isn't accepted by all scientists at the time. I and mean, it's always had problems, but it was used to dismiss not only the past observations of Vulcan, a.k.a. Phoenix, but it was used to silence all those who continued the search. There are four ironies here that do not escape me. I've written all four of them down. 
when I was doing all this research, there are four things about this entire scenario that I have to bring to your attention. One of them, the first irony is, uh, is Einstein was so impressed with Emmanuel Velikovsky's book, Worlds in Collision, about objects like Vulcan recorded in the ancient world, that he read it and he even vowed to have Velikovsky's theory put to the scientific test. But nine days later, Einstein was dead. It was the year 1955, and the scientific overseers who had arranged the rise of Einstein to the scientific prominence were now at war against Emmanuel Velikovsky. Perhaps it's a coincidence, but this is not. The second irony here is that 1929 Professor Frundlich, he set out to forever silence all those still searching for Vulcan. He took photos of the night sky, then took them again six months later. He found no objects that were out of the ordinary and therefore scientifically concluded that Vulcan did not exist. He did these, this photographing and he wrote this paper at Potsdam, known as the Einstein Observatory. Now, the third irony here is that anyone can research just a couple minutes today and find the thousands of papers, books, reports by members of the scientific community who now dismiss Einstein's theories because they do not explain all the new discoveries made by the scientists themselves. It fulfilled its purpose. It's done with, they don't even need it anymore. Remember, the observations and search for Vulcan was specifically dismissed, not because Vulcan wasn't real, but because Einstein's theory couldn't account for it. The fourth thing that I find very ironic here, the fourth thing, is that even recently NASA telescopes have caught images of this mystery object passing near or over the sun's surface. Scientists are the worst. Old theories passed off as facts. Are con they're constantly disproven. But there are never any admissions of bias. And further, when older models are no longer viable, the scientific books are never rewritten to undo all the prejudice and censorship the collapsing models inspired. Scientists are the worst hypocrites. Cordes recorded that in 1970 during an eclipse, the sun recorded, it was from Mexico, it was photographed by the Grum Aerospace, Aerospace Corporation, a number of mysterious objects were seen very close to the sun. So... This research continues, even as late as 2016. I have a picture right here. I'm going to put it up to a, a NASA photograph from 2016. So today, if you Google Vulcan, you will find a scientific overkill. Articles, books, scientific quotes, and papers all explaining to you that Vulcan was a mirage. Vulcan was a faint star misidentified. Vulcan was imaginary creative license. Vulcan was a mistake. But here in Archaics, I'm telling you Vulcan is the Phoenix weapon and the only thing mistaken here was Einstein.